Why is Halo important to you? No, I'm really asking. One of the most central parts of Halo's success has always been you and me, and the community it has built. So as we get into this video, and I talk about its tumultuous development cycle, its iconic story, and the brilliant masterpiece we got, I want you to think about that question, and comment it where we can all see it. Tell us your story. As for the game in question, Halo 2 is itself the product of a relatively untold story of a very difficult development cycle. Like a myriad of things going wrong and spinning up a stronger and stronger hurricane only to result in what was a perfect storm of events. Any other game following a hellish dev cycle like this would have probably ended up with us talking about what could have been and examining how and why such a lackluster game was created. That is not the case for Halo 2. Arguably the most beloved entry of the franchise, and definitely my absolute favorite one, Halo 2 is like a pillar of what is possible when a team actually loves and cares about the project they're working on. Because from what has been said about building this game, it wasn't easy. In a developer commentary for Halo 2, Joseph Staten claims he is shocked at how well this game holds together given how much the team struggled constantly to get it working correctly. And yet, here it is. The ambitious sequel to one of the biggest games the world has ever seen. In my video on the first game, we talked about the strange and chaotic development of the original Halo Combat Evolved. How it started as a Mac-exclusive real-time strategy only to then become a third-person action game before finally solidifying itself as a first-person shooter released as an exclusive for the Xbox. If you're a fan of Halo, I really recommend checking that one out, but if you're just excited to hear all about its sequel, then by all means, stick around and join me because I have a lot to say and we're going to be here for a while. Halo 2's development was a lot more straightforward in terms of what the team envisioned. Bungie knew it was going to be a space opera FPS. The pressure, however, had never been higher. After all, Bungie had just developed what was now one of the most purchased video games ever seen and there was an enormous fanbase clamoring at any sight of news of what the sequel might be. Although Bungie had a fanbase before Halo, it was less than a fraction of what it had become following Halo's release, and while Bungie had been an independent developer prior to that, it was now owned by Microsoft, which came with the benefits of a much bigger budget, a bigger team, and the pressure of one of the biggest companies in the world staring over your shoulder expecting you to strike gold two times in a row. The game had to be bigger, the stakes had to be higher. Halo 2 was about to follow up an industry-changing game and the team wasn't about to take such a responsibility lightly. Designer Jamie Griesmer claims that the team wanted to go bigger than ever and in his words, tripled everything. Artistically, mechanically, in general. Just as they were doing this, however, Bungie's founding member, Alex Seropian, walked away from the company leaving it in the hands of Combat Evolved's project lead, Jason Jones, who also stepped back from the project to work on a separate Bungie game after suffering severe burnout from the intensity of the development cycle. The game he was working on was referred to as Phoenix, and while we don't know a ton about it, we do know Jason was bouncing between Halo 2 and Phoenix at the same time since neither game really had a team leader. Unfortunately, this was causing problems on both projects, and there was a serious lack of communication throughout the company. Joseph Staten seemingly stepped up to the plate regarding Halo 2 and tried to ensure that Jones's core ideas for Halo 2 were implemented, while Jones would eventually consult with other Bungie team members, including the then Monster Hunter lead designer, Hardy LaBelle, and composer Marty O'Donnell, who both suggested that the Phoenix Project be killed. Following Halo 2's legendary E3 reveal, which we'll talk about more later, that is exactly what happened. Jones acknowledged that Halo 2 needed all hands on deck and killed the Phoenix Project to focus entirely on Halo 2. So they got to work and three years later, the iconic, dare I say mythical sequel was released on November 9th, 2004. Retail history a video game is expected to have bigger first day revenues than any movie has ever had an opening day at the box office. Biggest retail launch in entertainment history. You know, history. dozens of grown men and probably about three women have crawled out of their parents' basements tonight to be first in line to buy the new video game Halo 2. 
video gamers across the country are anxiously awaiting the midnight release of a game called Halo 2. 45 minutes and counting for Halo 2 to go on sale. The line right now is probably about 100 yards long. It is the most anticipated game in entertainment history. Upon its release, Halo 2 was immediately showered with adoration from the majority of the community and the industry at large, but it was by no means considered a perfect game. Many more cynical reviewers criticized the sequel for its shortcomings. A cliffhanger ending, which we'll get to later, a far more expansive look into the universe's space politics, which apparently some people didn't like, and a strong sharing of the game's screen time with a member of the Covenant whom you play as for roughly half the game. It's important to note, however, that these critics were outliers. Halo 2's release was beyond a critical and commercial hit overall. People were enamored by everything on offer from the ambitious new space opera title. It was bigger, better, and more impressive than its predecessor in nearly every way. The campaign and characters were loved, of course, but the multiplayer especially was where Halo 2 was really taking over the industry. I'll talk more on that later also. What I'm trying to say is that Halo 2 was competing with Hollywood blockbusters in terms of its hype. People were so excited, and the release was everything we fans wanted and more. Now, personally, I was only like 9 years old when all this was happening, but I'm telling you, this game is imprinted in my DNA from the amount of time I spent with it. I was obsessed with the powerful story of the Arbiter, a shamed warrior cast out of his faith and forced to fight for scraps of redemption, the heroic nature of the Master Chief who had become a mythological figure to his people, and the duality of their stories playing out side by side. Although the development of this game did not go smoothly at all, the work being done on it was not just the work of a bunch of paid employees clocking in and out, doing what's listed next and leaving. This was the work of passionate artists. I've been raving about the importance of games as art since this channel's first video on Metal Gear Solid, and the more I do these videos, the more I am cemented in that belief. Something not all of you may know is that there are developer commentaries for Halos 1 through 3, and in the commentary for this game, Joseph Staten reveals to us that he was in the Bungie offices alone the night before the game had to be shipped off for printing, working into the morning AM hours just to add a facial expression to the character of Miranda Keys in the final cutscene. This man was working into the AM hours in an empty office after everyone else had left and called the project finished to add one facial expression because he wanted the game to be as good as it could be. Not for profit, but for art, as an artist and a creator. Unfortunately, that same cutting it close, overambitious nature resulted in the team biting off way more than they could chew on everything they were hoping to do with this game. And that resulted in a huge amount of content being left on the cutting room floor. So before we go any further, let's take a look at the Halo 2 that never was, and examine some of the cut content. The most notorious of this was of course that iconic Halo 2 E3 reveal trailer, showing off so many exciting things that would not make the final cut, including a single shot battle rifle, an entire different area of New Mombasa which we never saw in the actual game, an encampment area showing the wounded soldiers from the fight, and a massive Covenant anti-air cannon dropped into the heart of the city that we watch be destroyed. It was also the appearance of the iconic Bet You Can't Stick It line too. When this trailer dropped, the scene exploded. There was so much to look at and analyze, but behind the scenes, according to Joseph Staten, this gameplay trailer was practically everything they had done and it was being held together with duct tape. Staten revealed in that same developer commentary that the E3 trailer was thrown together in haste and that following that reveal, they basically had to disassemble everything and redo it to make it even function. All these exciting ideas like boarding and dual wielding had to be coded over again to mesh with the game. Not only that, but Staten and Jones even expressed how surprised they were at how well the game actually ran on release because according to them, even the final product was a mess of code being held together with insane fixes and patches. They also went on to reveal so much additional content that was conceptualized, but never actually made it from paper to product, such as multiple levels that were supposed to be in the game. And I'm going to talk about those cut levels right now, in alphabetical order, not chronological. 
The first of the cut levels was called Alpha Moon, and was actually going to be where the Arbiter level Oracle is, with practically the same story beats of Arbiter securing 343 Guilty Spark. The difference, however, is that it was to be set on Basis, the Moon of Threshold. If you recall in my first Halo retrospective, I pointed out that Threshold is the planet we see from the original Installation 04 surface. This idea was scrapped and replaced with the Oracle level, but we do get to see remnants of this mission's ideas in the multiplayer map Burial Grounds. I'll talk more about that later too. The second of the cut levels, again alphabetically, is Covenant Ship. Veterans of the game may remember the cutscene where Chief flies out of the Cairo Station hangar bay and destroys a Covenant capital ship before then plummeting down towards Earth for the second mission. Well, that bomb scene was actually added sort of out of necessity to bridge the gap caused from cutting the mission that was supposed to be between Cairo Station and Outskirts. That mission was called Covenant Ship, and instead of flying out with a bomb, Chief was supposed to fly straight on top of the ship and then board it to destroy it from the inside. It could have been cool, but the bomb line is cool too. To give the Covenant back their bomb. This next level never made it past concept phases, and so there are no remnants of development assets within the game. But there was, at some point, going to be a level taking place on a flood-infested Covenant ship called the Infinite Sakaar, wherein a new grave mine was forming from the corpses of the dead Covenant on board. Although this level was not ultimately pursued, its concepts would later be reused in the 2006 Halo graphic novel in a story called The Last Voyage of the Infinite Sakaar. Next up is the level project lead Jason Jones is most regretful of having to cut, called Forerunner Tank. This level was meant to take place right after the Chief leaps into the water following his assassinating the Prophet of Regret, and also after the Arbiter is thrown down the Index Chamber by Tartarus. This level would have served as a sort of boss battle for the Grave Mind, where Chief would be forced to fight the monster while on this Forerunner tank, and it would show how the Master Chief got to Arbiter's location, and how they both ended up captured by the Grave Mind. Supposedly, the Grave Mind's tentacles would slam down and attack the player, and then the tentacles would move behind doors like racing freight trains. It sounds horrific in the best of ways, and I think we all lament its unfortunate removal. Nothing else is known about this level except a description from Jones where he says the Forerunner tank itself would be, quote, awesome that blows things up, glows a lot from little windows, and moves real fast, end quote. What a shame. The final cut levels are actually the entire last act of the game that got cut entirely and are the most glaringly obvious to be missing. Those three levels are simply referred to as Earth Arc and were to depict the Chief's final showdown against the Covenant on Earth. Most of these ideas would be revisited in some way later in Halo 3, but for those who are interested, you can find practically a full storyboard for the originally intended ending on Halopedia.org. These storyboards were released in 2020 and are really enlightening to look at. Other things were also revealed, such as cut dialogue recorded from Keith David for these final levels. And which promises that? That the great journey is for all of us? That the prophet shall lead us in good faith? That the elites shall make the galaxy a graveyard and never ask why or wherefore? You knew all along what Halo would do. How many would die. This is a forerunner? Oh, that is impossible. It cannot be. Now they shall have peace, while the fires of civil war burn throughout the Covenant. Come, let us make haste. It stands to us to put them out. There are also files from other levels that were worked on briefly, but quickly abandoned in favor of expediting development. I mean, we have to keep in mind, this was a huge game. And I don't just mean the size of the game, I mean the expectations. Halo 1 was a critical hit, and expectations from Microsoft and the fanbase were looming over this project, all the while it was in development hell. And like we covered earlier, it did eventually release to acclaim, but I would say that was by the skin of its teeth. Okay, I've talked about the game's development for long enough now, let's get to the meat of it and take a look at the product we got. Just like with the first Halo retrospective, I'll be playing and recording this on the Master Chief Collection Steam port of Halo 2, but let's talk a little bit about the other existing versions. Originally, there was but one, 
Halo 2 on the Microsoft Xbox. It's the one we all know and love, and for a while, it was the only way to experience Halo 2. However, nearly three years later, just before Halo 3 released, Halo 2 did see a PC port developed by Hired Gun, and designed exclusively to run on Windows Vista. Although unauthorized third-party patches did enable it to run on some versions of Windows XP as well. This little gem is kind of a unique outlier in the franchise, and features a few rare things that were locked to just this game until the release of the MCC. Among these are the two multiplayer maps, District and Uplift. Maps I had not even heard of until they caught me by surprise one day in matchmaking after Halo 2 released on Steam. I'll cover these maps in depth later in the multiplayer section of the retrospective, but let me say, they're really cool and much better than the PC exclusive maps for the first game. Also unique to Halo 2 Vista are achievements that can only be attained in this port and are the only existing Halo game achievements not tracked by Halo Waypoint. Chasing these is a self-contained challenge and may even be worth its own video someday. But I mean, the Steam ones are similar. The port was appreciated by the community overall, but its lack of online co-op support was its largest point of criticism. Although the original Halo 2 didn't support online co-op either, there were three years between the original and the Vista port, and Halo 3, which launched the same year, did include online co-op. One final note about this port is that until the MCC released, this was the only Halo game to truly be capable of running at 60 frames per second throughout the entire game. The other versions of Halo 2 aren't quite as interesting, basically just being the Xbox One version included in the MCC and the Steam port I'm playing today. Oh, and since I mentioned co-op earlier, let me talk about that for a second. The cooperative experience is beyond important to the Halo franchise. That classic couch co-op gameplay helped make Halo what it is. In my extensive retrospective of Halo CE, I talked about the co-op and its importance, but I only showed footage of the single player and did not do a cooperative run-through for that video. This time, I'm bringing on my good friend Eli from Deadlifts for the Dark Gods to do a full co-op run-through of the game with me. And what's even better, he has never played it before. So in this video, we'll talk about the co-op experience, and I'll have him on later to tell us about his first time playing Halo 2 and what he thinks about the game overall. So stick around, you're not going to want to miss that. Also, no worries, he's played Halo CE already, just not any of the others. But before we get to that, I'm going to be covering each mission of the game myself, one by one. For my single player run, which will encompass a huge part of the video, I will be staying mostly with the original graphics for a more authentic aesthetic. For my co-op run with Eli, however, I'll be utilizing the remastered anniversary graphics. This will also be the footage I use for most of the non-single player narrative sections of the game, so we'll have a healthy flux of both graphics. Also, I love the original cutscenes directed by Joseph Staten, but I'll be using the blur cinematics from the anniversary when showing them in the narrative section. With all of that out of the way, Let's take a look at Halo 2's campaign in full. Thanks for joining me, and I hope you enjoy my extensive retrospective of Halo 2. There was only one chief. One? Are you sure? Yes. They called it the Pillar of Autumn. Why was it not destroyed with the rest of their fleet? It fled as we set fire to their planet. But I followed with all the ships in my command. When you first saw Halo, were you blinded by its majesty? Blinded? Paralyzed? Dumbstruck? No. Yet the humans were able to evade your ships, land on the sacred ring and desecrate it with their filthy footsteps. Noble hierarchs, surely you understand that once the parasite attacked... There will be order in this council. You were right to focus your attention on the flood, but this demon, this master chief... By the time I learned the demon's intent, there was nothing I could do. of truth this has gone on long enough make an example of this bundler the council demands it you are one of our most treasured instruments long have you led your fleet with honor and distinction but your inability to
to safeguard Halo was a colossal failure. I will continue my campaign against the humans. No, you will not. Soon the great journey shall begin. But when it does, the weight of your heresy will stay your feet, and you shall be left behind. The opening of Halo 2 is the best of the series in my opinion. We are introduced to the Arbiter as we get to witness this immense amount of world building, seeing the Council of the Covenant and the Hierarchs, the Prophets of Truth, Mercy, and Regret. We learn that the Arbiter was in charge of the ship that vexed the Chief so much in Combat Evolved. He was the shipmaster who was staging assaults against us the whole time, and due to the destruction of Halo, a relic that the Covenant appeared to worship as holy gateways to an eternal afterlife, he is being punished. Although they don't ever say his name in the game, he does have one, Thel Vadam, but I'll just be calling him the Arbiter for most of this video. The Arbiter is scorned and essentially excommunicated before being informed that not only will he be executed, but that he won't even join the rest of the Covenant on the Great Journey. Apparently, his allowing the humans to set foot on Halo, much less blow it up, was an act of active heresy. As such, they demand recompense. As if to demonstrate a twisted duality, the Master Chief is suiting up to go and be presented with multiple awards for Valor for the same actions the Arbiter is being punished for. It really is a fantastic opening. This feels like it's rewarding the player's actions for Combat Evolved while also setting up the sympathy for this new character we will embody later. I can't praise it enough, it's genuinely my favorite opening to any Halo game. Also, it's worth mentioning that this game is chalked full of most of the best lines from the franchise, like this one. Drawn quite a crowd. If they came to hear me beg, they will be disappointed. Are you sure? Brilliant. Okay, so we get it. Our characters are like opposites on parallel paths. The action starts when a fleet of Covenant ships come out of nowhere and stage an attack on Earth, the human homeworld, a place the Covenant aren't even supposed to know about. So, we get yet another iconic line. Master Chief, defend this station. Yes, sir. I need a weapon. Right this way. Just chef's kiss. The stage is set, the Covenant are here, and we're standing between humanity and total extinction. Let's get started. It's fitting that just like Combat Evolved, Halo 2 opens with a mission in space. This one, however, is a little different. We're not on a lost capital ship, we're on a giant space station. A space station that is built entirely around a skyscraper-sized cannon called a Mac gun. What a fantastic setting to open a game on, I'm here for it. This mission is pretty much a spectacle to play through, opening the combat with a cinematic sequence of the Covenant crashing into the side of the station and the door being plasma-torched straight through before blowing open and combat ensuing. What an excellent start to the game. It really helps the player feel empowered, like they've done this before and now they're back. The next sections are awesome as well, showing how this was built as a station intended for people to live on despite its war capabilities. This area feels like somewhere you'd see people just living their lives and now it's drowned in blood and hot plasma. The Covenant designs are accentuated here too, I think. Their colorful uniforms pressed against the gray hues of the human design. This mission really picks up, though, when you end up fighting your way down a hallway alongside Captain Miranda Keys, the daughter of Jacob Keys from the first game. She'll play a much larger role in this game than her father did in the first one, however. Uh-oh. Hey, they're leaving the Athens. Cortana, assessment. That explosion came from inside the Athens. Same as the Malta. The Covenant must have brought something with them. A bomb. Then they sure as hell brought one here. Chief, fight. We get a little taste of outer space combat here too, as we enter the station's exterior and fight off a handful of Covenant elites on the surface of the station. This section shows off the lessened gravity of the station in regards to combat, which really just means you'll be jumping a lot higher and moving a lot slower. We don't spend as much time out here just yet as we will shortly, however, as this is just warming us up. 
This elevator here is another memorable moment from this level. It feels very reminiscent of something games would do in this era. Something about a giant slanted elevator just feels like home in old games. This is also where the game introduces us to our first new enemy. We only saw a portion of the aliens that fight within the ranks of the Covenant in Halo CE because only one main Covenant capital ship gave chase. In reality, there are a lot more races fighting within the ranks of the Covenant Armada. These are called Yanmis, but the humans call them drones, and it's obvious why. They're small, they fly, and they are deadliest from above. This next part is, again, a testament to how much bigger Bungie was trying to make Halo 2 feel. Just look. I love this. And time. guess what we get to do next? Yeah, we're going outside to fight on top of the giant gun, because this is Halo and of course we are. This is pretty much the last major set piece of this mission before we cut through the Covenant forces guarding the bomb and disable it. Me, inside your head, now. How much time was left? You don't want to know. Cairo, this is an emberclad. The carrier shield is down. I'm in position and ready for immediate assault. Negative, Commander. Not against a ship that size. Not on your own. Sir, permission to leave the station. For what purpose, Master Chief? To give the Covenant back their bomb. Permission granted. I know what you're thinking, and it's crazy. So, stay here. Unfortunately for us both, I like crazy. Just one question. What if you miss? I won't. Chief then rides the bomb through space in one of the coolest cutscenes in sci-fi history and blows up a Covenant cruiser. For a brick, he flew pretty good. And we fly down to Earth to make these aliens pay for their hubris. Hoorah! Mission 2 opens really strong with a fantastic set piece in the city streets of New Mombasa as we get straight into the midst of what is essentially a full-scale invasion of the city. Which I'm glad this is such a cool way to open the level as it leads straight into what is one of the weaker aspects of the game overall. You see, Halo 2 has this really nasty habit of forcing the player into these little tower defense sections. They do a really good job of hiding it, and if you're just enjoying the gameplay and soaking in the exciting atmosphere of it all, you probably won't even notice. But when you've played it as many times as I have, it becomes more glaringly obvious that this game tends to try and pad the length of its levels by locking the player's door to progress and throwing three to five waves of Covenant soldiers at them before finally unlocking the door. It's not like egregious, and it's implemented so well into the level design that you probably wouldn't even notice it upon initial playthroughs, but I'm telling you, once I point them out throughout this video, you won't be able to unsee it, so proceed with caution. Speaking of unlocking the door, the Covenant sends some familiar faces to literally bash it down. This is a great way to reintroduce this enemy type to the player and feels appropriately climactic. What follows after we overcome the Hunters is a certain alleyway that's sure to cause PTSD flashbacks in the brains of those who have played this game on Legendary. Now I'm playing on Normal, so it's not a problem here, but on higher difficulties, these Jackal Snipers will execute you before you've even managed to walk around the corner all of the way. This might be one of the hardest sections to get through, actually, for Legendary playthroughs. I also love this darker hallway where Bungie is giving us a reason to use our flashlight and flexing what their engine is capable of. On the other side of it is a gorgeous sight to see. The massive city in the distance, the sunset skybox, the explosions and firefights occurring in the sky, it's just exceptional. What could make it better? 
How about a warthog to drive along the beach side with? You'll probably notice the parallel to the first game where the second level gives you a warthog about halfway through to introduce driving mechanics. But unlike in Combat Evolved, the level never opens up. It stays pretty linear, but it's more than well designed enough as a level to warrant it. Literally, if just a few things were a little worse, this long tunnel section would be a drag. If it was even three minutes longer or more frustrating, I guarantee people would complain about it. But it manages to have enough interesting scripted instances and be consistently entertaining enough to not wear out its welcome before we reach the end. Sir, if we don't get the hell out of here, you hit Marine. N no, sir. Then listen up. Fun fact these two Marines are voiced by Hollywood celebrities David Cross and Michelle Rodriguez, who were both apparently big fans of the first game. It's no secret Rodriguez is a gamer, but this again is Bungie just flexing that massive budget increase they got. Oh, I know what the ladies like. I don't have words for this sequence. Crossing a massive bridge into a huge city where we see a Covenant capital ship hovering over that city, meanwhile we employ this scorpion tank to utterly annihilate several different ghosts, a wraith, and some banshees just in the first five minutes of the level. We haven't even entered the city yet. We need to pass through a tunnel back underground where we run into another celebrity cameo. It's tight quarters on the other side, sir. Use this. And get back outside to requisition this here Covenant beam rifle. In the background, we can see our target running away from us, which I don't blame it. We also see Bungie flexing one of their new additions to the game. An NPC drives up in a warthog, inviting us to take control of the Gauss Cannon rather than having to drive. NPC drivers have a mixed reputation across the Halo games, but I figured I'd play along for this playthrough, and actually, he's not half bad. I mean, he's not the best, and he makes some really stupid driving decisions sometimes, but to be honest, it's really not that bad. I played through pretty much the whole intended section as the gunner, letting the marine handle the driving. Of course, shortly after we clear this area out and move in to meet our boys inside the marine command post, that scarab comes back around to make himself known again, where we witness the devastation in full. Try as we might, these bullets aren't doing anything about this situation. That thing has to go, and fortunately, we're coming up on a place where we can get the drop on it, and I mean that literally. Then it's just a matter of clearing out the bastards inside and setting this thing to self-destruct. <laughs> Chief and return to you in Amberclad. Roger that. Status. Sir, the Prophet is bugging out. Request permission to engage. Negative, Commander. All Vector 2 heavies for star side intercept. Bam! Flip space rupture off the target's bow. It's going to jump inside the city. There's no time, sir. Green light. Green light to engage. Punch it. Get us close. Ma'am, without a destination solution, we are not losing that ship. Why not toss him in with this lot? 
They could use the meat. Them? What about us? My belly aches. And his flesh is seared just the way I like it. Quiet! You two whimper like grunts fresh off the teat. He's not meant for the jails. The Hierarchs have something special in mind. Noble prophets of truth and mercy. I have brought the incompetent. You may leave, Tartarus. But I thought... And take your brutes with you. Release the prisoner. The Council decided to have you hung by your entrails and your corpse paraded through the city. But ultimately, the terms of your execution are up to me. Halo's destruction was your error, and you rightly bear the blame. But the Council was overzealous. We know you are no heretic. This is the true face of heresy. One who would subvert our faith and incite rebellion against the High Council. Our prophets are false. Open your eyes, my brothers. They will use the faith of our forefathers to bring ruin to us all. The great journey is... This heretic, and those who follow him, must be silenced. This slander offends all who walk the path. What use am I? I can no longer command ships, lead troops into battle. Not as you are, no, but become the Arbiter. And you shall be set loose against this heresy with our blessing. What would you have your Arbiter do? What you've just seen is the introduction of a new protagonist, which is kind of insane. It's really rare to see things like this in a video game. Typically we get a single protagonist to play through their journey from start to finish. In Halo 2, we not only split the screen time of our heroes, but this second protagonist is a member of the enemy faction. Oh, and he was also the Supreme Commander during the Fall of Reach and the Battle of Installation 04. So we're now playing as the character who was trying to kill us through the entirety of the last game. So as we embody this new hero, this Arbiter, we're given one task. Find the leader of this new anti-covenant movement and kill him. This mission takes place on a massive Forerunner gas mine while an enormous lightning storm happens in the distance, closing in on the station the whole time. Hilariously, that lightning storm is a red herring for Chekhov's gun. Tartarus mentions it near the start, and it gets brought up once or twice, but I'll get to why I call it a red herring in a minute. Mobilizing with our task force, we eventually end up having to chase the heretic enemy into the skies, which, if you're playing casually, then this is your introduction to Halo 2's improved flying mechanics. I say if you're playing casually because technically you can hijack a banshee in the previous level if you know what you're doing. When I say improved flying, I mean it, because... The Banshee controls so much better, and it's got more moves this time to help it feel more climactic and exciting. This is such a great time and location to introduce the flying too, because while Combat Evolved had a good flow, it still felt a little enclosed in comparison to this level. Things are open and vast, and there's tons of good enemies to take down. It's just a fantastic way to handle this part of the mission. Eventually, we track the heretic leader down, but just barely miss him. What is it? That stench. I've smelled it before. Something's wrong. Something familiar yet dreadful. An aroma fills the air. One the Arbiter, Thelvadum, recognizes. That scent permeating this facility? It's the Flood. The parasitic alien life form being kept hidden on Installation 04 has somehow made it here too. And they're trying to kill everyone on board this station. This was such a great way to bring the Flood back into the game. It was given a brief mention and then thrown straight into the player's face. None of the build-up or anticipation of the original, we know what we're dealing with here. The fact that it's not even really given any build-up makes it all the more jarring as we descend deeper into the core, defending this elevator against the Flood. 
Man, it's a tower defense situation again. Just like I mentioned back on Outskirts, they're really good at slipping these little moments into the game where you're stuck in a single area while hordes of enemies pour out and try to game into you. I will say that at least they've managed to be pretty subtle about it so far, making it natural and... Never mind, we are in another tower defense section where we have to defend this room against hordes of flood once again while trying to wait until the doors open. I will say, the term tower defense isn't the most accurate. You're not so much defending an area as you are just trapped in an area while trying to kill enough enemies to progress. I don't hate it, but it does end up making this level feel a lot weaker than the previous one. We do exit straight into this fantastic set piece area where the outside is visible, and it feels really climactic. Even the worst levels of Halo 2 are as monoliths to any other video game from this time. And what follows in this level actually makes up in full for the two defense arenas in a row. We catch up to the heretic leader and confront him. This will save me from the storm, but you will be consumed. Arbiter, where is he? The stinking floodbait boxed himself in tight. We'll never break through this. Then we shall force him out. How? The cable. I'm going to cut it. Get everyone back to the ships. That line is one of the coolest lines uttered across the whole franchise. Now we get to make good on our promise and head up top to cut the cable. We're going to force the heretic out of his hiding place. There's just something... I mean, look, I've played a lot of video games. This kind of scale, this kind of rule of cool nonsense, it isn't common. And I'm convinced that it's why Halo towered over its competition. There are three cable supports that hold the main line, and so we go to each one and slice it loose with our energy sword. With the tower currently in freefall, it is past time to hunt this bastard down and put an end to this. In a boss battle, which is a first for the Halo franchise. Again, more on that later. This is what I meant earlier about the red herring. The game keeps talking about the lightning storm coming closer, but that isn't what complicates the environment. It's us chopping the cable and causing the whole station to freefall. It's a little bit infamous that the origin of that cable line came from project lead Jason Jones walking into the office of cinematic director Joseph Staten and telling him, without context, that he must find a way to implement three lines of dialogue into the story. Those three lines were, the cable, I'm going to cut it, I am a monument to all of your sins, and only blood will pay for this. Jones did not give Staten any context for these lines, and so he had to work them in organically into the main story. We'll cover each line as we come to them. We finally chase this heretic leader in a banshee while the tower is falling into a nearby station. This guy is persistent. Sacrifice us all for nothing. More questions? Splendid. I would be happy to assist you. The elites are blind, Arbiter. But I will make them see.
This is the first of multiple boss battles in Halo 2. They are in no way a staple of the series and are pretty inconsistent in execution and inclusion. For some reason, Halo 2 has three notable boss battles and several smaller what I would call mini boss battles. They're fun and I am by no means complaining, but it is pretty interesting that they just kind of come and go depending on which game you play. Nevertheless, we take the heretic leader down and finish our job. Unfortunate. His edification was most enjoyable. I had no choice, Holy Oracle. This heretic imperiled the great journey. Oracle? Great journey? Why do you meddlers insist on using such inaccurate <laughs> That is the Oracle. So it is. Come. We are leaving this system. Tartarus doesn't seem to like the Arbiter at all. Anyway, we should check back in with what our other hero is getting up to. Report! Both engine cores have spun to zero. We're drifting. Archer pods are cold. I'll need to rekey the system. Do it and find out where we are. Sorry for the quick jump, Sergeant. You in one piece? I'm good. Yeah. Chief? We're fine. Ma'am, there's an object coming into view now. Cortana, what exactly am I looking at? That is another halo. <laughs> Say what? So this is what my father found. I thought halo was some sort of super weapon. It is. If activated, this ring will cause destruction on a galactic scale. I want all the information you've got on the first halo. Schematic, topography, whatever. I don't care if I have the clearance or not. Yes, ma'am. Where's our target? The enemy ship has stopped above the ring, ma'am. We're going to pass right over it. Perfect. Given what we know about this ring, it's even more important that we capture the Prophet of Regret. Find out why he came to Earth, why he came here. Chief, take first platoon. Hard drop. Secure landing zone. Sergeant, load up two flights of pelicans and follow them in. Aye, aye, ma'am. Until I can move and fight, I'm going to keep a low profile. Once you leave the ship, you're on your own. Understood. Over the target, in five. Hang on to your helmet. Mind the bump. So there's another Halo, and we gotta get down there and stop the Prophet of Regret from doing whatever the hell it is he's about to do. Rounding up a band of ODST Marines, we touch down in the ruins of some ancient temple near where Regret has set up shop already. He started posting up Covenant forces all over this portion of the ring, so there's that to deal with. After storming this temple, we wipe out the forces currently occupying it, taking it as our own. After doing this, however, we call in some transportation to make getting around faster, which means we'll have to hold down this LZ and wait for our Warthog while defending this position. Yeah, it's another defense section, where we take out a few waves of incoming Covenant forces again. This one isn't as bad though, as it doesn't last very long at all before we get our Warthog delivery and get to move on. This scenery is once again a very strong reminder of why Halo 2 was utterly crushing its competition at the time. Look at this. My understanding from listening to developer commentary about this game was that Halo 2 was being held together by the coding equivalent of duct tape and prayers, but man, you wouldn't be able to guess it. This level alone offers up this subliminal suggestion of magnitude that we are currently on an alien ring world surrounded by structures so ancient that they predate human existence. Which is exactly where we are, actually. 
I'm sure my adoration of Halo and the nostalgia together are forcing some kind of blinders, but I struggled to think of any game that was pulling off this kind of operatic scale from this time period. Pushing through these ancient ruins, we wind up in this delightfully designed waterfall gully, a place where Halo 2 is really showing off its verticality and giving the player a chance to play with the beam rifle. It kind of becomes a sniper battle, which is fun, but you don't necessarily have to play it this way. We're still hunting the Prophet of Regret, and while chasing him, the Chief stumbles upon a hologram of Regret singing some kind of chant. Wait, go back. That's what I thought he said. The Prophet of Regret is planning to activate Halo. Are you sure? I shall light this holy ring, release its cleansing flame, and burn a path into the divine beyond! Pretty much. Commander, we've got a problem. So I hear. But from what I understand, the Prophet will need an object, the Index, to activate the ring. I've located a library similar to the one you found on the first Halo. If the rings work the same way, the Index should be inside. I'll bet the Covenant are thinking the exact same thing. Then we better beat them to it, Sergeant. Extract your men and meet me at the library. Yes, ma'am. I'll secure the Index, Chief. You take out the Prophet. He's given us all the intel we need. The Prophet of Regret has decided to activate Halo. This Halo, Installation 05, to, I think, no one's surprise. Shocker not notwithstanding, the necessity and expediency of our assassination mission just tripled, and he has no intention of making it easy. The Covenant kindly drops a couple of hunters down to get in our way, which of course we make sure work of. That gondola coming our way is going to take us to that smaller temple in the distance, which we have to get to before we can make our way out to the much larger temple in the center of the lake. That is where the Prophet of Regret has holed up. Looks like they're riding their own gondola out here right now to confront us. Fine by me. Once in this smaller temple, we can take out the Covenant posted up here and access the underwater gondola to take us in closer to the temple. It won't take us all the way there yet, though this sequence is super stunning to look at. It's like every level brings with it some new and interesting thing to see. Of course, eventually we do make it to the main temple where we are greeted by turrets, snipers, and oh yeah, the entire Covenant fleet. That's the largest Covenant fleet I've ever seen. The largest anyone's ever seen. Get inside the temple and kill Regret before it can stop us. Alright, no more games. Let's go kill a prophet. How? I hear you ask? We're gonna beat him to death. Alright, now it's time to get out of here before they send reinforcements. Or, you know, do that. Are you questioning my decision? No, Holy One. I only wish to express my concern that the brutes... Recommissioning the Guard was a radical step. But recent events have made it abundantly clear that the Elites can no longer guarantee our safety. 
I shall relay your decision to the Council. Do you know, Arbiter, the elites have threatened to resign, to quit the High Council, because of this exchange of hats? We have always been your protectors. These are trying times for all of us. So something pretty crucial just happened here. The elites have acted as the honor guard for the Prophets for as long as the Covenant has been around, but following the execution of the Prophet of Regret, they have now been removed from this role and replaced by the so-called Brutes. This matters a lot, and is in fact not only a massive slight to the honor of the Sanghili's position in the Covenant, but an aid to the Jarohani race's plot to usurp and ultimately remove the Sanghili from the Covenant altogether. The Sanghili being the elite race name, and the Jarohani being the Brute. The key. You will journey to the surface of the ring and retrieve this sacred icon. With it, we shall fulfill our promise. Salvation for all! And begin the great journey. Once the shield is down, you will head straight to the library. I do not wish to keep the Hierarchs waiting. The human that killed the Prophet of Regret. Who was it? Who do you think? The demon is here? <laughs> Why? Looking for a little payback? Retrieving the icon is my only concern. <laughs> of course. The Arbiter is back again, and this time we're in one of the most unique locations of the game, although also one of the shortest, the Sentinel Wall. The purpose of the Sentinel Wall is to surround the library and create a sort of energy barrier to contain the Flood. This wall is also self-sufficient and manufactures Sentinels to defend and repair it, so it's conceptually perpetual. It's also standing in between us and said library. In action, this level is one of constant descent. We have to keep finding access ports to lower levels in order to slowly make our way to the bottom of this wall, one level at a time. Before we get very far into this facility, we get to face down a Sentinel Guardian. These are kind of like mini-bosses, but they aren't too hard if you just lob a few plasma grenades onto them. Look at this visual, though. We can see such a clear visual of the inner Sentinel wall as we take this trolley across deeper into the massive Forerunner structure. Of course, there are no shortage of flood here, similar to the library found on Installation 04. Presumably, there should have been a sentinel wall on that ring as well, although we never really see it since Guilty Spark takes us straight into the building via the teleportation array. It's at this point we start finding dead humans, and our comms begin picking up human voices. Seems Miranda and her team beat us here, but not by much. We are quite literally right behind them. Before too long, as we reach the end of the level, we see it, for the first real time, the library. I mean, this speaks for itself, doesn't it? We take the short way down and meet up with some of our elites at the bottom and get to see a really great little scripted event happen. That's a sentinel ship being shot down in the distance, and that is actually going to matter here shortly, but it's so cool to see it like this. We press further on only to end the level on yet another waved tower defense-like section. Why does it seem like Arbiter is always the one stuck with these? I mean, Chief gets a few, but there's way more common for the Arbiter. In the center of this zone is a sacred icon critical to the great journey. I must find it. We shall cut into the heart of this infestation, retrieve the icon, and burn any flood that stand in our way. 
Parasite is not to be trifled with. I hope you know what you're doing. The humans are one step ahead of us, so we're going to have to close the gap with a vehicle section. I tried running the gun and letting the AI drive this section, but it just isn't feasible on this level. I had to take the wheel for this part. I have less to say about the first half of this level since it's just a stream of vehicle sections broken up by sections forcing us out onto foot before needing to find another vehicle. We do have to work our way through the freshly shot down remnants of that sentinel ship we saw get shot down earlier, which is really cool. Eventually though, we do finally find the massive Forerunner gondola which will take us straight into the library. More humans. They must be after the Icon. On your way, Arbiter. I'll deal with these beasts. What we have here is another visual spectacle, and not only that, we can look to our right and see that the humans are just barely ahead of us in finding the index. So we have to ride this gondola to the end of the level and defend it from waves of flood. It's another tower defense section. A visually stimulating one, but it's still just a tower defense section. Miranda actually beats us to the index though, despite our best efforts. You know, your father never asked me for help either. The index is secure. Mackenzie, Perez, how's our exit? You hear me, Marines? We got trouble. learn of this, that they will take your head when they learn. <laughs> Fool. They ordered me to do it. Well, this is the narrative point of no return. The Arbiter has been betrayed by the Prophets, and we now get to witness the most unlikely of meetings. this thing off. Demon. This one is mission and nerve, and has 
as its mind concluded. This one is but flesh and faith, and is the more deluded. Kill me or release me, Parasite. But do not waste my time with talk. There is much talk, and I have listened. Through rock and metal and time. Now I shall talk, and you shall listen. Greetings. I am 2401 Penitent Tangent. I am the monitor of Installation 05. And I am the Prophet of Regret, Council of Most High, Hierarch of the Covenant. A reclaimer? Here? At last. We have much to do. This facility must be activated if we are to control this outbreak. Just stay where you are. Nothing can be done until my sermon is complete. Not true. This installation has a successful utilization record of 1.2 trillion simulated in one actual. It is ready to fire on demand. Of all the objects our lords left behind, there are none so worthless as these oracles. They know nothing of the great journey! And you know nothing about containment. You have demonstrated complete disregard for even the most basic protocols. This one's containment. <laughs> and this one's great journey are the same. Your prophets have promised you freedom from a doomed existence. But you will find no salvation on this ring. Those who built this place knew what they wrought. Do not mistake their intent, or all will perish as they did before. This thing is right. Halo is a weapon. Your prophets are making a big mistake. Your ignorance already destroyed one of the sacred rings, demon. It shall not harm another. If you will not hear the truth, then I will show it to you. There is still time to stop the key from turning. But first it must be found. You will search one likely spot. And you will search another. Fate had us meet as foes, but this ring will make us brothers. We are, all of us, gravely concerned. The release of the Parasite was unexpected, unfortunate, but there is no need to panic. In truth, this is a time to rejoice. A moment that all the Covenant should savor. For the sacred icon has been found. With it, our path is clear, our entry into the divine beyond guaranteed. The great journey is nigh, and nothing, not even the Flood, can stop it. Kill the demon! Okay, well now the chief just got literally teleported to high charity and we just barely missed killing the prophet of truth by a split second. Not our focus. We need to find Miranda and secure the index before truth activates the ring and literally wipes out everyone and everything in the galaxy. And... Yeah, we have another wave-based defense section. And on higher difficulties, these brutes are pretty much mini-bosses in and of themselves. That line, I am a monument to all your sins, is another one of those lines, by the way, that Jason Jones gave to Joseph Staten without context. I really do enjoy this level, but it's fairly straightforward overall. The first thing we do is find a prison cell of sorts and free a band of marines from their cells. They then proceed to aid us in combat for the remainder of the mission. Unfortunately, they will all be dead by the end of this. Something very special is happening in this map, and I mean aside from being able to witness the city of high charity in all of its glory. The Covenant are, of course, trying to kill me, but they also seem to be fighting amongst themselves. Turns out that little exchange of hats 
was a little more insulting than the prophets had intended, and the elites are very unhappy about the situation. So we're running through high charity in the midst of a literal civil war, which makes it such a damn shame that this level is not only not very long, but this short level is the only level where we get to actually watch the Covenant Civil War happening on this Covenant homeworld of high charity. Which does make it easier for the Chief to fight his way through this mess, although not exactly easy in general. The Elites and Brutes may want to kill each other, but they tend to agree they want to kill you more. Making it to the end of the line is where potentially the best sequence of the game plays out. We enter the literal mausoleum of the Arbiter and join a huge fight between the Warring Covenant factions, beating them both, all while Breaking Benjamin's original song they wrote for this game plays in the background. I'm not so sure we'll ever reach peak levels such as this ever again. The hopes of all the Covenant rest on your shoulders, Chieftain. My faith is strong. I will not fail. Let him be. The great journey waits for no one, brother. Not even you. We're back with the Arbiter now, and he's been teleported onto Delta Halo near some strange and massive Covenant building. This is the same Delta Halo from before, but it is layered with a kind of deep melancholy now. The sky is gray and the colors have been zapped. The Arbiter has been teleported to see the dead bodies of his own people on the ground. His race, loyal to the Covenant, has been betrayed and are being genocided by the Brutes. This is the level where the third line Jason Jones had imagined was supposed to be. Only blood will pay for this. Although it didn't make it into the game, we do see the level's description saying that the brutes must pay for the blood they have spilled. The vehicle sections are back in full again, which is cool, and it's also interesting how the Chief and Arbiter seem to trade off on vehicle-centric levels so it doesn't feel too repetitive. Just some great level design from the staff at Bungie. I think you'll see that this environmental design is beyond phenomenal too. I mean, just have a look at how gorgeous it all is. Although I will say that this level feels quite lacking in set pieces, and seems to go by rather quickly, clocking in at less than 20 minutes to beat for me, as opposed to the game's more median average of about 30 to 45 minutes per. Your pal. Where's he going? Earth. To finish what I started. And this time, none of you will be left behind. That structure in the center of the city, it's a forerunner ship. And Truth is heading straight for it if he leads the Covenant fleet to Earth. They won't stand a chance. You have to stop him. That brute has the index. And Miranda and Johnson. He can activate the ring. If he does, I'll detonate in Amberclad's reactor just like we did the Autumns. The blast will destroy this city and the ring. It's not a very original plan, but we know it'll work. No, I don't want to chance a remote detonation. I need to stay here. to agree now that Halo 2 is eye candy? I mean, pure and simple, this whole thing is like a sci-fi novel came alive. Back with the Master Chief again, we're in for arguably the shortest mission of the whole game. 
That is, if you're not trying to clean every room of enemies. The Flood have arrived on High Charity now after literally flying the In Amber Clad to Truth's last location to try to find the Index and stop Halo from firing. The Gravemind is really trying to keep that array offline and he's using any avenue he can think of. Now, we're already used to the Flood in Halo 2 as we've been fighting them this whole time. As the Arbiter. This is actually the first time the Chief has seen the Flood all game so far, and it's in his last mission of the campaign. I mean, unless you count the Gravemind encounter, which is fair I guess, but we as the player didn't have to fight the Flood in that level. Our flashlight finally makes itself useful in this level too, for like two or three very short sections. It's an overall borderline useless tool in this game except for this level, and honestly even then you barely need it. Everything is pure chaos right now, as the Covenant's civil war has now become a desperate swan song against imminent demise from the Flood. I kind of feel bad for the place. I mean, this is a giant city planet, and every single being on it that doesn't escape is going to die. And they're all going to fight desperately for days, I would imagine, before succumbing to the infection of the Flood. Of course, the Prophet of Truth is very much not about that life, and is headed straight up out of here. So, Chief is going to chase him onto his ship and follow him to wherever it is he's going. Fun fact, this was actually supposed to be a Warthog run, but it was cut from the game due to time restraints and reworked into a cutscene, which was the right move in my opinion. Chief, when you get to Earth, good luck. After I'm through with Truth. Don't make a girl a promise. If you know you can't keep it. What is that place? Where the counselors were meant to watch the consecration of the icon. The start of the great journey. There is still time to stop the key from turning. I must get inside. Then mount up, Arbiter. I know a way to break those doors. We haven't really talked about Ritas Vidam yet. That elite in silver armor we've seen in most of these cutscenes is a high-ranking elite, and when we meet him, he is the Special Operations Commander. He was known as half Jaw in the Covenant due to literally having half of his jaw blown off during a battle against the humans. He was, much like the Arbiter, involved in the Battle of Installation 04, where he encountered the Flood and was the only survivor from his ship. He will go on to play a pivotal role in the events following the Great Schism as he unites the elites against the Covenant. Right now he is pledged to assist the Arbiter in stopping the Ring's activation, and so he offers us up this wraith to carve our way to Tartarus. Also, he will not give us this tank on Legendary, forcing the player to use the Spectre or continue on foot. One of the coolest parts of the game is about to happen as well, when we abandon the Wraith and fight our way up to the balcony where they are holding the humans hostage. The Hunters come to the aid of the Elites and help us fight our way through the brute forces. This is one of the only times this ever happens across the series, and I love it. This is a great close quarters battle too, as we get to free some of our elite brethren from captivity and confront the brutes holding Sergeant Johnson hostage. Listen, you don't like me and I sure as hell don't like you. But if we don't do something, Mr. Mohawk's gonna activate this ring and we're all gonna die. Tartarus has locked himself inside the control room. Well, I just happen to have a key. Come on, grab a banshee and give me some cover. Gonna know what's coming. This is it. From here we grab a banshee and fight our way through a horde of wraiths, ghosts, specters, and enemy banshees in one final flight sequence. Then of course, we watch Johnson use the proto-pattern scorpion he and his boys have requisitioned to blow a hole into the door Tartarus locked. And so now we just have to overcome all of Tartarus' best men by ourselves. Good thing we can turn invisible and utilize stealth. Come, human. It is easy. Take the icon in your hands and do as you are told. Please use caution. This reclaimer is delicate. One more word, Oracle, and I'll rip your eye from its socket. Mm. Which is nothing compared to what I'll do to you. Tartarus, stop. 
Impossible. Put down the icon. Put it down. And disobey the Hierarchs? There are things about Halo even the Hierarchs do not understand. Take care, Arbiter. What you say is heresy. Is it? Oracle, what is Halo's purpose? Collectively, oh, not another word. Please, don't shake the light bulb. If you want to keep your brain inside your head, I tell those boys to chill. Go ahead, do your thing. The sacred rings, what are they? Weapons of last resort, built by the forerunners to eliminate potential flood hosts, thereby rendering the parasite harmless. And those who made the rings? What happened to the Forerunners? After exhausting every other strategic option, my creators activated the rings. They and all additional sentient life in three radii of the Galactic Center died as planned. Would you like to see the relevant data? Tartarus, the Prophets have betrayed us. <laughs> no, Arbiter! journey has begun, and the brutes, not the elite, shall be the prophet's escort. Yeah, we gotta kill this dude. Have we talked about Tartarus? Let's do that as we engage in yet another boss battle in this game. Something that seems to come and go in this franchise. Tartarus was the final of the chieftains of the Jiralhani. He is also the right hand of the Prophet of Truth and the main enforcer of the Hierarchs. Predictably, this wasn't enough. He wanted to usurp the elites as the highest ranking race in the Covenant, aside from the Prophets, and as it turns out, the Prophet of Truth wanted this also. Long before the destruction of Installation 04, the Prophet of Truth feared an eventual revolt from the Sangheili race. You see, Truth was convinced of this idea of a great journey, but he was also more than aware of the truth regarding humanity's true nature as reclaimers. Multiple so-called heretic encampments had already been becoming more popular as they proclaimed the truth about Halo's purpose, and were almost always led by an elite. And in their honor-bound culture, Truth feared that should they learn the truth about humanity and lose this facade that humans were heretical vermin who disgraced the Forerunners, the Covenant would fall apart. This being such a powerful possibility, Truth figured it would be best if he could be in charge of engineering the ordeal. And so he favored the eagerness of the Brute to prove their value to the Covenant and orchestrated the Great Schism when the opportunity presented itself. By the time he had left High Charity, he figured it was too late for the Covenant to matter, and that he would land on Earth and shortly thereafter find his goal and activate every single Halo Array at once. He did this already hoping Tartarus would activate Delta Halo, thereby dealing with himself, the Arbiter, and everyone anywhere remotely close to that ring, which is where we are now just seconds away from the extinction of every being within 25,000 light years, according to Guilty Spark. So obviously, we kill the Chieftain, thanks to some help from Johnson, and stop that from happening with mere seconds to spare. What's that? A beacon. What's it doing? Communicating at superluminal speeds with the frequency of... Communicating with what? The other installations. Show me. Failsafe protocol. In the event of unexpected shutdown, the entire system will move to standby status. All remaining platforms are now ready for remote activation. Remote activation? From here? Don't be ridiculous. Listen, Tinkerbell, don't make me... Then where? Where would someone go to activate the other rings? Why the Ark, of course. And where, Oracle, is that? We've got a new contact, unknown classification. It isn't one of ours. Take it out. <laughs> 
This is Spartan 117. Anyone hear me? Over. Isolate that signal. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. Wait, that's it? That's how it ends? That's not an ending! Yeah, that's how we were all feeling back then when the credits rolled. Halo 2 is very much part 2 of a three-part story, and although it faced heavy criticism for that decision on release, it was looked upon much better retroactively. Also, the decision to end on a cliffhanger was not an easy decision for Bungie to make, nor was it their intended ending. There were plans earlier on to end the series with this entry, but as the game progressed, and the scale grew, and the story expanded, they just eventually realized that they had to ship the game before they could complete it, and if they didn't make some hard cuts, then it wouldn't be ready in time. And so they trimmed, altered, and refined until we got what we got, which was not only one of the best video games ever released, but my personal favorite Halo game, Halo 2. Man. Going through Halo 2 has been one hell of a great journey, and I've always been pretty candid about it being my favorite game from the series, so I was well aware I would have some heavy bias going into this, and as such, wanted to bring a friend of mine on to give his opinions on the game as he had never played it before he did so for this video. Deadlifts for the Dark Gods and I have been friends for years, but he had never played Halo 2 before. So I asked him to run through it with me and then feature his thoughts on this video. What did you think, man? I played Halo 2 for the first time ever with Evan, and overall I enjoyed it very much. From the fun gameplay with amazing environments, to the incredibly beautiful cutscenes with the most iconic lines in all of video game history, I had a great time. I have a few thoughts on the levels which I will share with you all today. Firstly, at the very start, we get a little bit of mystery, wondering why the Covenants have attacked Earth with such a small fleet. Fighting the aliens off of the ship is lots of fun, and stepping out into space to see the giant macro cannon is epic. We also get multiple absolute banger lines in the first mission like, tell that to the Covenant, I need a weapon, giving the Covenant back their bomb, and more. It really showcases just how insanely epic Master Chief is as he rides a live bomb into a Covenant ship, blows it up, and gets out on skates. Upon Earth, we get to travel to Africa, driving a massive tank on a massive bridge with a massive city in the background. Sheesh, say no more. This level was a ton of fun, even if I had to watch my Marines die as I took a Wraith Cannon and shot straight to the face. Shooting stuff with the Scorpion is surprisingly fun and doesn't get old. Hitting a Banshee out of the air is so satisfying and makes you feel like a sharpshooter, even though though in reality, it isn't much of a challenge at all. The cable, I'm going to cut it. How is our bitter so cool? While his levels themselves can get pretty slow, these moments make it worth it. Cutting the cable is just so epic, along with fighting on a rapidly falling building with banshee chases and the likes. We also get to start to see the truth about the Covenants being revealed with the heretic's last speech to Arbiter. The underwater level was probably my favorite, with the coolest part being in the room with the water on the floor. When you enter this room, you originally see nothing, and then all of a sudden see splash in the water as camouflage elites charge towards you. The whole aesthetic of the level is awesome, with the wacky submarine elevator scene bringing it home. I will admit fighting the Prophet of Regret was a little goofy, with the punch animation clipping a bit, but it has its own charm. The final stages of the game was where things really got good for me. The levels were very exciting and much more challenging. They felt smooth and brutal at the same time, similar to Doom. The scenery somehow got better, and at this point I was ready to send some suspicious packages to 343 if something bad happened to Miranda and Johnson. So the first mission towards the game's climax puts you on the Covenant's homeworld, which is an artificially made world, easily one of the coolest classics in sci-fi. The scenery is insanely awesome, and the sudden civil war takes you by surprise, and they showcase it very well. I knew it was going to happen, but the surprise of the event was still epic to see. Going through missions not knowing who to shoot at first and watching the Covenant kill each other is quite satisfying as Master Chief. On the flip side, desperately fighting for survival alongside your elite brethren as Arbiter is awesome. The ending of the game was great. The boss fight was challenging and you felt an actual sense of urgency as you were fighting for the survival of the entire galaxy. Being backed up by Johnson and Keyes is so cool too. Just working together with them in general for the whole level was such a fun addition. The Covenant side of it really brings Arbiter home to the player to shine him in the light as a good guy. When you finally beat the big man with the hammer, we get a great cutscene of the gang finishing things up with some beautiful effects from the ring. Guilty Spark then informs you that victory has not yet been assured, which gives us the perfect cut to Master Chief and of course ending the game with the line, finishing this fight. Oh man, 
If I hadn't listened to Evans Infinite Games a million times, I would have gone crazy hearing such a line. Thankfully, I can play Halo 3 whenever I want, so I don't have to wait three years, of which I am thankful. The after credit scene with Cortana is great too. Overall, I gave the game a 9 out of 10. For me, the story was a 10 out of 10, with all the characters being likable and badass or hateable villains. I cared about Miranda and Johnson and was worried about whether they would live or not. Well, I knew Johnson would live, but I wasn't so sure about Miranda. Having them make it through gave me actual relief. Everything Arbutter and Chief did and said was complete badassery every time, and the dialogue was just incredible. Where the game lost points for me was specific parts of the gameplay itself. Most of the missions were 8 out of 10s to 10 out of 10s, especially the openers and the final missions. Where they lacked a lot for me were the Arbiter tower defense sequences, of which there were quite a few. They just weren't very fun, and dying on them was frustrating because it was just the same thing over and over again. The Flood were not particularly fun enemies to fight in this situation, as I felt they were more fun in the dark and spooky rooms, jumping out of the shadows or chasing you down as a never-ending horde at your back. Other than those though, it was great. Cutting the cable and fighting on a massive falling object, battling on the bridge to New Mombasa, going to assassinate a prophet underwater, getting portaled onto the Covenant homeworld and fighting in a civil war, escorting Johnson with some air support, just amazing. I was so happy to finally play through this game, and especially with a good friend. It was easily one of the best gaming experiences I have ever had, and certainly the best one I have had in a long time. Thank you to Evan for giving me the experience and letting me talk about it on his video. Now back to the retrospective. Alright, it's time to get down into the grit. This section is for my lore nerds and franchise fanatics. I'll be breaking down each weapon and vehicle in the game by its lore, but only as far as Halo 2 is concerned if I can help it. I skipped out on this section in my video on CE due to time constraints and feasibility, but we're going all in this time. Let's get started and talk about the weapons of Halo 2. The Battle Rifle, one of the most iconic weapons of the franchise and basically one half of a replacement weapon for the assault rifle from the previous game. It's a three round burst fire bullpup weapon with a times two scope and a 36 round magazine. Technically, this weapon is supposed to be capable of both a single shot fire mode as shown in the E3 reveal trailer and a full auto mode. Although this may have been the plan early in development, and it's apparently the case in the lore, we only ever get to use it as a burst fire weapon. At one point in Halo 2's development, there were going to be melee combos, and the battle rifle is the only weapon the public ever got to see that feature tested with. Disappointingly, this was another among the many ambitious features that was cut before the final release. The battle rifle would become a crucial element of the infamous multiplayer strategy dubbed by the community as the noob combo, wherein a player would run around with a charged plasma pistol until they found another player, fire off the charged shot to drain their shields, and quickly swap to the battle rifle for a final kill shot. The pistols of Halo remain a constant controversy within the franchise ever since the Mac Gun Planet Killer Ultra 92000 hit the scene, also known as the Halo 1 Magnum. What do you do when you accidentally make your starting sidearm the most proficient and deadly weapon of the game? How do you fix that in the sequel? You nerf the absolute hell out of it to the point where it's nearly useless. Well, I mean, I don't want to be too hard on it because a lot of the weapons in this game suffer from extreme BB gun syndrome. However, I can confidently say that it's all for a very good reason. Halo 2 introduces one of my favorite new features, the ability to hold two weapons, two games, Two guns, thousands of dead aliens. You can dual wield a lot of the guns you find, even mixing and matching which guns you choose. This comes with one notable upside and one notable downside. I say notable because there's probably several of both, but I'll just cover the big ones. The big downside is that in order to compensate for the fact that you'll so frequently be doubling up on weapons, is that half of the weapons have been nerfed to hell. The big upside is that holding two weapons at once is awesome. It's one of the coolest mechanics in the game to me, or in any shooter really. Not every weapon can be dual wielded though. Such as the M41 Spanker for example, otherwise known as the Rocket Launcher. With a two rocket capacity and a rotating semi-automatic rechambering mechanism, this shoulder mounted game over message is a staple of the franchise and arguably at its most powerful here in the sequel thanks to the insanely overpowered auto lock functionality. 
Then, of course, we've got the shotgun, a favorite of mine if I'm being honest, despite the fact that it's not really at its strongest here. Halo 2's M90 features green iron sights as opposed to the blue-colored one seen in Combat Evolved and Halo 3, which I always thought was an interesting choice and made the subsequent choice to revert back to blue in Halo 3 seem a poor design decision. The green stands out more, and it's just my preference in this weapon's design. One of the coolest weapon additions to Halo 2 is without a doubt the Energy Sword. Man, this made waves when the game dropped, and I loved this thing. Its hilt contains a battery, a plasma distributor, and a magnetic field that contains the plasma within its boundaries, thus shaping it into the iconic sword we know and love. Some variants of the sword contain a failsafe measure, where if the user drops the blade without disengaging it, the sword automatically disables its own magnetic field, causing the plasma to be let loose, thereby consuming the battery and destroying the hilt, and with it, the blade. We saw these models on Installation 04, but these are a rarer model, and the mass-produced variants of the Energy Sword do not contain this failsafe to prevent enemies from stealing them, which is the lore reason why we can pick them up in Halo 2, but couldn't before. I actually almost forgot this one, the Fuel Rod Gun. The Pestic Pattern Fuel Rod Gun is a shoulder-mounted radioactive semi-automatic mortar launcher. Due to the dangerous nature of the weapon's design and its ammunition of choice, humanity has had very little luck in studying or understanding it, but we are relatively sure it comes from old Forerunner designs. In the first game, a version of this weapon is seen, but it's purple and utilizes a battery instead of ammo. That one is called the Zasqui Pattern Fuel Rod Gun. The Needler makes a return in Halo 2 and is one of the weapons we are able to dual wield this time around, which, let me tell you, these things can become a power weapon in themselves if you're holding to it once. These weapons fire off a pink crystal extracted from a mineral called Kimiksuru, but humans call these Subanese crystals. They're found on the moon of Suban, one of the two satellites that orbits the Sangheili homeworld. The crystals are sharp and explosive, and if you get enough smaller shards near each other, they'll super combine and explode into a blaze of pink mist. Whereas the human sidearm got nerfed to near uselessness, the Covenant sidearm is mostly the same. The overcharge takes more energy than it did in Combat Evolved, the rate of fire is a bit slower, and it does do damage, but I don't think the nerf is as bad on this one as it was on the Magnum. Frag grenades are back, as are plasma grenades, both functioning roughly the same as they did in the last game, but both do feel like they do less damage this time around. The M7 submachine gun, affectionately shortened to SMG, is one of the new weapons being introduced to us in this title. Since the overpowered alien incineration cannon known as the assault rifle hasn't come back from the first game, we're instead getting that concept split in half into two weapons. The first of which was the prior mentioned battle rifle, and the second is this bullet hose. This weapon feels like it was made exclusively for being dual wielded, and although it's pretty useless on its own, pairing it with a needler, plasma pistol, or even another SMG can make a shield shredding combination. The sniper rifle, or if you want to be technical, the SRS-99D-S2AM, is a 145 by 114 mm semi-automatic high-powered rifle. That 57 caliber round could cut a human being in half if it hit you, so it's safe to say you wouldn't want to be hit by one. The weapon overall isn't that different from the original and handles pretty similarly too, yet I just can't get over the fact that this thing fires an anti-tank round. Back to some of the newly introduced weapons again, the Particle Beam Rifle is probably most notorious for being the number one game ender of any legendary speedrun. The variant we see in this game being utilized by the Prophet of Regret's units is the Sulak Pattern Beam Rifle. It fires out a high-powered ionized particle beam that pierces straight through shields, armor, hopes, and dreams. Another new one is the Jovokata Workshop Brute Shot, which is a 52mm high-explosive grenade launcher with a massive blade built into the frame. That blade can one-shot your shields, and the grenades can be used as a direct launcher or for more skilled players as a mortar to flush out enemies. Mosa Pattern Carbine, or Carbine if you prefer, also debuts in this game and acts like the Covenant answer to the UNSC Battle Rifle. As with a lot of the weapons we've looked at, this one was also designed by the Sangheili, also known as the Elites. Not much to say about this one, it's a semi-automatic plasma rifle essentially. 
which the plasma rifle is also back, but it's gotten a pretty significant nerf from the first game too. The upside is that you can dual wield them, along with the so-called brute plasma rifle, which is a red version of the weapon that fires way faster, but also overheats faster and drains battery faster. While the blue plasma rifle design is in pretty much every Halo game, the red brute plasma rifle variant seems to come and go, making it feel a lot more rare. This is likely because the design is originally made by elites, and there is an obvious animosity between the two species. And then lastly, we have one of my favorite inclusions, the Sentinel Beam. Though we did see these in Halo Combat Evolved, we couldn't use them like we can in this one. Picking them up, these are the only totally forerunner designed weapons we get to use, and they are the most effective against the Flood, which makes sense given they were designed for use specifically against the Flood. And that's all of them. Well, which is a ton, to be honest. Halo 2 has a huge inventory of weapons to choose from compared to its predecessor. And since I've talked about all of the weapons, may as well go over the vehicles, Halo 2 brings us seven solid vehicles to play with across its different levels and game modes. Of course, I've got to start with one of the most iconic, the M12 Puma Warthog LRV. We get two variations of the Warthog this time, but the first is our reliable classic four-wheel drive all-terrain Xenos flattening machine. It's pretty much the most used vehicle by humanity during the war and features a colossal M41 light anti-aircraft gun mounted on the back, also called the Vulcan. With only two to three people, this little Jeep can quickly become a nightmare for Covenant forces. But maybe that's not big enough for you. Maybe you need something a little more explosive. Well, don't you worry. The UNSC is here to deliver with the M12 G1 Warthog Lav. It's literally the exact same thing as the other one, but replaces the machine gun with an M68 Gauss cannon. This cannon in question fires off a 25 by 130 millimeter round, which is ridiculous enough to be totally fictional and only a thing in Halo, as far as I know. If that still isn't beefy enough for you, then don't worry, because we've got a vehicle with an even bigger gun. The M808B Scorpion tank is equipped with an M231 machine gun and an M512 smoothbore high-velocity cannon, which lets loose a 90mm tungsten delivery of deletion. It fires faster than the one in combat evolved, and the machine gun is far more accurate now, but at the expense of the speed as the tank is now overall slower. I mean, how much do you really need to know? It's a tank! Then we've got the Covenant vehicles, with three returning staples and one new introduction. Back again is the Banshee, which was an integral part of the first game's campaign, and is even better this time around now that it features significantly more maneuverability and the ability to board and steal it from opponents in midair, a feature that players would use to get out of bounds routinely. Relying on anti-gravity pod technology with two wings attached for balance and boosting. They are single pilot vessels, but they can be deadly towards infantry. Another single pilot Covenant vehicle is the Ghost, and utilizes a similar anti-gravitational technology to the Banshee, but in a different way which keeps it landlocked, but offers more speed and versatility for ground combat. These will likely be the most common Covenant vehicle you'll encounter. What would happen if we took the design of the Ghost, made it bigger, armored, and gave it a plasma mortar, you ask? You'd get the Wraith. It's big, powerful, purple, and very dangerous. The large radius of effect from its mortar rounds can quickly terminate your run, destroy your vehicle, and flatten a battalion of marines. Okay, maybe not a battalion, but a few dozen at least if placed right. The final of our Covenant vehicles is the newly introduced Spectre, an infantry support vehicle that can hold multiple passengers and sports a massive plasma cannon on the back, not too dissimilar to the Warthog. Interestingly enough, this vehicle really doesn't show up again in any other entries of the franchise. It's pretty much only ever seen in this game. We get other kind of similar vehicles, but this is the only game we ever really use the Spectre. Although it does get mentioned in several of the Halo books. And lastly, not technically vehicles, you can use ground mounted turrets throughout the campaign. And on some multiplayer maps. They are exactly what you see on screen. Is that everything? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Something big. Oh yeah, that! The Covenant Protos Pattern Fortress Breaker, also called the Scarab. This quadrupedal mechanical monstrosity crawls through the city blowing holes through skyscrapers with what's called an ultra-heavy focus cannon. 
Can you imagine what humanity could do with tech like that? The power of the sun in the palm of our hands? And that's all the weapons and vehicles at Halo 2. When Halo 2 was released to the public, it totally changed the landscape of how multiplayer was seen by the industry. The competitive nature of video games was there from the start, but Halo 2 was like a steroid injection to the industry due mostly to its link with the launch of Xbox Live. This allowed players to log in and play against people from all over the country or even the world. The feeling of logging on and fighting randoms to the death over a pixelated flag and the mic chat. Man, I often lament that I missed out on this era. I've only ever heard about its glory from friends who were a bit older than me and got to live it. <laughs> like, kid gloves are off you. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? I'll die for you! No! 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 Cut him out! Evan, I thought you were a blue team player for a second. Oh, nope, I'm out. Nothing <laughs> about it happened to me. This experience must have been unlike anything we'd ever witnessed before, and to be quite honest, it was special beyond the average video game. After Halo 2 came out, every game after tried in different ways to emulate or capture that same invigorating gameplay that totally monopolized the market. Halo 2 didn't create the esports genre, but I think it's fair to say it popularized it. For the time it was up, Halo 2 was the online multiplayer experience of a lifetime. And you'd have to be insane to think I'm not going to cover the story of the Noble 14. So strap yourselves in, because I'm about to tell you about the last stand of 14 Noble Spartans against the very forces of entropy and corporate apathy. In 2010, roughly six years after the initial release of Halo 2, and three Halo games later, Microsoft formally announced that it would be pulling the plug on Halo 2's Xbox Live multiplayer support. Players had until midnight on April 15th, 2010 to get their final matches in, and so thousands flocked back to the game to be a part of the last days of the iconic video game. Then, something special happened. The deadline came and went. The players who remained realized that so long as they remain logged on, the servers wouldn't close. And so began the last stand of the Halo 2 player base against the inevitable end of the original game's online existence. Players delighted as they continued to play even after the deadline, but the grim realization soon began to manifest that this wasn't a second chance, just an extended goodbye. Slowly, over the next day or so, thousands became hundreds and hundreds became dozens. As soon as a player left, there was no way back. Power outages, life events, whatever. Once you were gone, that was it. A final stand of Spartans made their call, to see it through to the end. Days passed, full cycles of life, work, industry, but these players remained, their persistence keeping the servers from closing. Before long, there were only 14 players remaining. These players were named as followed via their gamer tag. Denton, Cypher Sword, Sherlock1, H20 Shogi, Zombie Stench, Rob2D, Hired Noobs, XX Booker DXX, A Foreign Object, Dirty Cajun, XX Mac Daddy XX, Lord Odysseus 11, and lastly, our final two, Agent Windex and Apache Enforcer. These brave Spartans remained online as long as they could to prevent server shutdown, but one by one they fell. Bungie ceased stat tracking on April 19th, and so all subsequent information is only known by what was tracked by the community. Din 10 fell sometime after stat tracking stopped after April 19th. Cypher Sword was the next to go on April 28th, and then Sherlock 1 and H20 Shogi. On April 30th, Zombie Stench's internet dropped and Rob2D followed suit. Then Hired Noobs disappeared. By the time the calendar turned to May, Two solid weeks after the servers were supposed to have shut down, seven players remained. On May 2nd, XX Booker DXX would fall victim to a power outage, and a foreign object would fall to the same fate shortly thereafter. May 5th would see the fall of Dirty Cajun, and two days later, XX Mac Daddy XX would go missing as well. Lord Odysseus 11 then fell to an internet drop on the same day. 
on May 10th, nearly a full month after the servers were said to shut down for good, two Spartans remained. Agent Windex and Apache Enforcer. Then, at 4.15 a.m., Agent Windex would fall, but not before speaking the final words uttered between two players on Halo 2 servers. Good job, Apache. You're the last one. One day later, on May 11th at 1.58 a.m., Apache would fall, and the servers fell with him. I am so enamored by this story that I really was hoping to interview the two myself and include their story in this video, and hopefully even reunite them in a dialogue or brief interview. I sought out and invited both Apache and Agent Windex on to talk about their story, reaching out on multiple platforms back in mid-December of 2023, but unfortunately, I did not hear back from either of them. Even still, both them and the rest of Noble 14 have my respect for their efforts in holding the line in an unwinnable battle. I spoke before in other videos about how sometimes, every so often, we're lucky enough to see art and meta manifest itself in real life. Semblances of the passion behind the art inspire real world events, almost like fate. If you're a fan of this series, then you know what I'm talking about with this moment and what it means. All I'll say is, Thank you to the Noble 14 who stood against time, and let it be known that they're still out there. Because Spartans never die, they're just missing in action. With that out of the way, let's dive into what exactly made up this multiplayer mode that invigorated so much passion in its players. We'll start with the available game modes. Halo 2 stepped everything up two notches. We've got way more game modes to pick from this time around, and let's just say, Halo fans were eating good when this one dropped. Returning to Halo 2 from the previous entry were all of the staple game modes that had become beloved by the community at the time. Slayer, the standard fair all-out deathmatch, playable in teams or free-for-all. Capture the Flag, of course, an iconic game mode for any competitive match. King of the Hill, where I personally feel it found its peak with this game's maps and mood and Oddball, one of my favorite modes where teams have to fight over a skull and whoever holds it the longest wins. Notably absent this time around is the race game mode, which was available in Combat Evolved. We know that this mode was seen in an alpha build of the game, but upon release, fans found the mode did not make the final cut. In its place though, we do get three new game modes, one of which would become far more popular than the mode it replaced, that mode being Juggernaut. If you've played Halo, you know what this mode is about. One player gets selected at random to be given a multitude of advantages, and then all other players have to seek out and destroy the Juggernaut. Whoever successfully kills the Juggernaut then assumes the role and gains those benefits. Technically, there was a mode like this in Halo CE, but it was a variant of Oddball. Halo 2 refined it and introduced it as its own mode. The other two modes introduced in Halo 2 were Assault and Territories. Assault is kind of like reverse capture the flag. Each team is given a bomb, and the two teams must try to plant that bomb in the enemy base. Then lastly, Territories is a zone control variant where multiple zones appear across a map and players must fight to control those territories. All of these game modes combined to create what has remained to this day to be one of the most exciting online multiplayer experiences anyone has ever seen. Now I have to admit, this next section of the video is the part I was most looking forward to. While doing my Halo 1 retrospective, the feeling it gave me to go through all of those multiplayer maps and give my thoughts and speculation about them was so, I don't know, exciting and fresh. This time, we have even more maps to cover, and I want to talk about every single one of them. Of course, some will get more time than others, but these are some of the coolest maps ever made in a multiplayer game, ever. That being said, I'm going to have to try to be quick, as I have 25 individual maps to go over, so strap yourselves in and let's look at every map available in Halo 2. The first map we're looking at is Ascension. Here players can fight on top of a relay station that operates on Delta Halo. This relay station was discovered by the UNSC Coral Sea after it followed other UNSC vessels in pursuit of the Prophet of Regret. Upon finding Delta Halo, the UNSC Coral Sea began investigating the ring when the crew found various of these relay stations. Ascension is one of those relay stations, and fighting on this map is particularly interesting because of the massive rotating pillars attached to an in-ground signal dish. 
It's also infamous for being one of the various maps in which players could perform the Super Bounce. A glitch players found that allowed them to hit a certain spot in the map that would cause a collision issue and launch the player into the sky. I've always really loved this map because it's smaller and great for tight-knit games of 4v4. Fans of the original game will recognize the return of this iconic map. Battle Creek from Combat Evolved is back. Kind of. Although this location strongly resembles Battle Creek, the UNSC refers to this place as Beaver Creek. We're on Delta Halo this time, and the resemblance is because each installation features a very canyon-heavy biome to host their Forerunner telemetry spikes. The rocky terrain creates an ideal location for these telemetry clusters and allows for spires to form synchronization conduits which make up the fabric of the ring's translocation grid. Or more simplistically, the spires synchronize to create a pattern across the ring which allows for instant teleportation anywhere on Delta Halo. Why am I talking about the telemetry spires when there's none visible on this map you might be wondering? Because these two bases are not bases at all. They're buildings meant to house the generators which power those telemetry spires. So although they're not immediately visible here, we can see the bunkers that power them. Beaver Creek is once again a very small map intended for smaller battles, but it's definitely a fan favorite even to this day. Now this is a map with some incredibly fascinating lore, both in-game and IRL. Burial Mounds takes place on Basis, one of the moons orbiting the planet Threshold the very planet Installation 04 orbits as well. Looking around the map, it's readily apparent what we're seeing right now, the scattered and descending debris of what was once Halo. This is one of the coolest looking multiplayer maps in the game. It's actually so visually unique that it might look more to you like the set piece of a single player map even. That's because it is. Burial Grounds is the remnant of the cut content that was originally a single player mission called Alpha Moon, wherein the Arbiter infiltrated a base of heretics that had set up shop here on basis among the wreckage of the original Halo ring. That mission was, of course, scrapped and reworked into a gas mine, but this map shows us the fractured memory of what could have been as we watch the destroyed pieces of Installation 04 rain down upon us whilst we play our 4v4 to 8v8 matches here on Burial Grounds. Another favorite map from Combat Evolved has made its way into Halo 2, known previously as Blood Gulch, now appropriately called Coagulation. As the UNSC Coral Sea ran scans of Installation 05, they stumbled upon this canyon with two small bases on each side. It is speculated that this was once a proving ground for young Forerunner warriors as they trained in various combat sports, similar to how we utilize the arena in Halo 2's multiplayer. Of course, this map is probably most well known as the stage for many seasons of the popular comedy web series, Red vs. Blue. It's a very simplistic map in terms of layout, and the large open terrain makes this the perfect map for 8v8 matches of CTF, Slayer, and more. We're back to the gas mines of Threshold, but this is not actually the same gas mine that the Arbiter cut down in the main story, but rather a different one. Thanks to the exploration data of an expedition from the UNSC Red Horse, and the corroborated data of the Sangheili forces following their alliance with humanity after the Great Covenant Schism, we now know that there are multiple of these gas mines within Threshold's atmosphere. It's an interesting little map, but I don't really like how it plays. It's very open, and the lack of cover means there's so much room for snipers to pick you off from a distance. It's most definitely a map made for long-range players. This particular map is located in Chicago, of all places. Industrial Zone 8, specifically, actually. The purpose of this facility was to serve as testing grounds for the Tactical Autonomous Robotic Defense System, which was an early attempt by Acheron Security to design a series of autonomous combat drones. This pursuit was abandoned along with the facility when biological augmentation of human subjects proved to produce significantly better results. What's left is an optimal training ground for Spartans to face off in. In a meta sense, this map was actually inspired by the Thunderdome map in Marathon 2, one of Bungie's earlier games. It's also the only multiplayer map in Halo history to require being unlocked before it could be played. You had to complete the campaign before this map would become available to play, but this was very short-lived. The map was automatically unlocked for players upon the game's first auto-update via Xbox Live. It's a fun map, but another wide-open one. I have very good memories of owning this map as a kid once I got my hands on that energy sword, though. 
Now we've got another big map to cover. Headlong is set on Earth in Section 14, a city site currently under construction off the coast of New Mombasa. A 100% fan favorite not only for matchmaking, but also for super jumping. Due to the sheer size of the map and the amount of things to see out of bounds, this map was actually very different in the alpha build, but was refined and redesigned before the game eventually shipped. What we got is one of the best BTB maps from the franchise, with tons of dynamic areas and a host of vehicles with which we can create some mayhem. The monument at the end of the map also bears a striking resemblance to Bungie's old 7th column icon, a relic from a different time. It's a great map for objective-based game modes, but sometimes it does feel a little unbalanced in my opinion. Ivory Tower this lovely high-rise apartment was once home to the wealthy New Mombasa socialite, Lance O'Donnell. Over time following his departure of the building, however, it was turned into a lovely indoor park for the wealthy elite to host gatherings. The name Lance O'Donnell is pretty obviously a reference to series composer Marty O'Donnell, and his music studio literally called Ivory Towers. This little map is beyond memorable. The layout is a work of sheer genius between the power weapons hidden around the map like the energy sword, rocket launcher, and sniper rifle, the ramps leading players up and down, and the elevator taking them between one of three floors. This is easily one of the most chaotic maps for a solid 4v4 match. In fact, I would say this is arguably one of the best maps in the game. I love it. This map is also where players can hear the song Siege of Madrigal, hidden for those willing to find it. An old track from Myth 2, the song has become a notorious easter egg littered through the classic Halo titles. Another one of my favorite maps, Lockout is one of the smallest arenas in the game. Lore suggests to us that this location was actually discovered by the UNSC in Amber Clad as it was collecting data before its inevitable demise. Lockout was actually supposed to be a map in Halo Combat Evolved, but was cut before the game's release, so it was repurposed for Halo 2 instead. Man, I'm just imagining what it would look like in CE graphics, to be honest. I bet it would have been awesome. Nevertheless, this map was designed specifically for smaller, more tight-knit 4v4 matches, and I have spent many hours fighting over the power weapons on this secluded little Forerunner research station. Probably the thing this map is most known for, however, is for being the first recorded sighting of a so-called Ghost of Halo. Called the Ghost of Lockout, a video was posted nearly 20 years ago at this point showing a glitch that caused what looked like a non-player Spartan to move around the map without animation and attempt to kill the players. At the time, it was doubted and said to be a mod or something, but more occurrences since and additional research have suggested that more likely it was the result of a network error. Even still, this video sparked the hunt for more of these ghosts, and they've been found on at least one other map in Halo 2 and in other entries after. Hovering above Earth following the events of Halo 2 is the Ket pattern battlecruiser called the Pious Inquisitor. And you guessed it, that is exactly where this map takes place. It's another smaller map meant for 4v4 combat, but honestly, 8v8 matches on this map are chaotic in the best way. This was actually the first map designed for Halo 2's multiplayer mode, and the intention behind it was to create, quote, absolutely the smallest map possible, end quote, although it doesn't feel all that much smaller to me than some of the other maps. The key factor here is going to be that energy sword at the top center of the map. Due to the close quarters nature of this map, that sword can be utterly devastating in the right hands. The polar opposite of midship, Waterworks, was designed to be the biggest map in the game, and it very much so is. The only potential competition to this map's size isn't even in the base game. Waterworks takes place in a giant cave wherein a forerunner drainage system is placed, which makes sense given that the aesthetic design is very similar to that of the temples where the Prophet of Regret was hiding out in the campaign. This leads me to believe that this cave is probably somewhere near that temple, possibly connected straight to that temple, honestly, and located under one of the mountain ranges we can see from the main game. Of course, the web series Red vs. Blue depicts this cavern as being directly underneath the coagulation map, which is as good a theory as any. I'm not really sure what the purpose of the giant piston is, but I assume it has something to do with the drainage system around Delta Halo. The stalactites located around the map can also be shot down and potentially kill someone if timed correctly. The last map that actually came with the base game is arguably the most recognized Halo 2 map in general. Zanzibar is another Earth-set map, taking place at Wind Power Station 7, one of various different Wind Power Stations on Zanzibar Island. 
The large wheel is a power turbine connected to a larger generator inside of the base, and this map features a multitude of different ways to interact with it, like breaking the bars that hold open the windows to the base, or you can open the front gate to let in vehicles to allow for easier bomb placement or flag extraction. There's all kinds of easter eggs hidden on this map too, like this blue screen message, which is a classic. Zanzibar was the first map to be revealed to the players all the way back at E3 2004, giving them their first glimpse at what they could look forward to when Halo 2 finally hit the market. It's for sure a staple map of not just this title, but the franchise as a whole. That's all of the maps that launched with Halo 2 when it first released, and they were more than enough to make it the most played game on the Xbox Live Marketplace. That being said, Bungie wanted to keep participation going, and by this point, the concept of downloadable content was starting to manifest. With Halo 2 being on the cutting edge of video game industry advancement, of course it would be on top of releasing additional content for players via Xbox Live DLC. There would be 11 more maps released across Halo 2's Xbox lifespan, across four different map packs. Let's take a look at all of these exciting new battlegrounds. These 11 maps were released across the span of four different DLC map packs, three of which were eventually bundled and sold as a physical disc expansion for the game. The map packs were each named in order the Bonus Map Pack, the Killtacular Map Pack, the Maptacular Map Pack, and lastly, the Blasttacular Map Pack. So let's start with the Bonus Map Pack, released April 25th, 2005. The first map we're looking at is called Containment, and it is aesthetically brilliant. This map is set on Delta Halo, but very close not only to the Sentinel Wall, but the library in general. We can even see the library in the skybox. I love when multiplayer maps are integrated into the game's lore like this. The developers originally began work on this map as a reimagining of the Gearbox Combat Evolved map called Timberland, but it slowly morphed into more of a Sidewinder successor by the end of it all. The fusion energy cores littered around the map can be used tactically since they explode, making them very dangerous for vehicle combat, but originally, these things were supposed to be organic flood sacks called boo bags. They would have served a similar purpose, but were originally supposed to be able to move and bounce around. They were made static to simplify the dynamic of their inclusion. When researching the map, I stumbled upon a piece of trivia about the face hidden in the ring being used as a prop for the machinimal web series, This Spartan Life, which triggered a buried memory in my brain that I didn't even remember I had. Like you feel their eyes on you. Cold, evil eyes watching hey man cut it out you're creeping me out me too <gasps> i remember this i remember watching it i literally watched this show as a child man old school machinima was so dope anyway this is one map I was convinced was in the vanilla game for some reason, but nope. It was added in later via the bonus map pack, sponsored by Mountain Dew. That's not even a joke, this map pack was literally sponsored by Mountain Dew. This is not only one of the smaller maps, but also one of the simpler to explain. Warlock is set in an ancient Forerunner temple which pays homage to the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. It's a rather simple map, but eagle-eyed players were probably able to piece together that Warlock is a remake of the popular Combat Evolved map, Wizard. As if the name wasn't a dead giveaway. Following the bonus map pack, the Killtacular map pack released shortly thereafter. And I do mean shortly, as in, on the exact same day. Both of these packs dropped on April 25th, 2005. Not sure why, but that's how they did it. The first map from this DLC is called Sanctuary. Although I haven't gotten to play more than a few matches of this particular map, its Halo Reach remake would become one of my favorite maps of all time. But that's for another video. Much like Warlock, this map is centered around a Forerunner shrine of some kind, being made up of the aged Forerunner ruin architecture found on Delta Halo. Many of the assets here were originally meant for use in the campaign mode level Delta Halo, but we're simply reused here for Sanctuary. It's a phenomenally designed map, intended for 4v4, and I love playing SWAT matches in particular on it. 
This is another Earth-centric map taking place before the slipspace destruction of New Mombasa, with this particular terrain being in Old Mombasa. It's a really small map, but it does have some really cool little elements to it, one of which is the scarab remains that have collapsed into the city. I really like this. It adds such a massive dimension of color to make this map stand out from other military shooters of the time. On top of that, there are a few very interesting Easter eggs, like the Rooster Teeth logos on these soda machines, the little Texas company known for making Red vs. Blue. It was very clear the team had a few fans in its ranks. Normally, a map such as this would feel a little strange in Halo, but it manages to be just distinct enough to make itself a great time for Halo players. Next up is the Maptacular Map Pack, the third DLC to be released for Halo 2, but this time featuring five maps in total, and all of them are pretty sick. Backwash is super rare for the franchise because it's one of the few maps to actually be set in a flood-centric environment, and heavily resembles Combat Evolve's big flood reveal. This map is distinct for several reasons, actually, and may very well be the most underappreciated map of the franchise. For one, we actually have an active NPC who moves around the map. It's the monitor of Delta Halo, 2401 Penitent Tangent, which makes sense as the game is pretty much about Delta Halo. That being said, that wasn't actually supposed to be Penitent Tangent. Up until the map was nearly complete, the monitor included was 343 Guilty Spark. It was literally only changed near the end because the developers felt he looked too much like a plasma grenade flying through the air due to the blue color. This is also one of the only maps across the Halo franchise to offer a sentinel beam on spawn. So yeah, this is probably the most notable of any map from the game, despite the fact that it is, unfortunately, not very popular. Just like the last map, this is another very unique map across the franchise as it's set on a UNSC cargo freighter. The UNSC Onan sits in Earth's orbit as it pushes onward to make its delivery, although this takes place right at the same time the Battle of Earth does, so just know that anytime you're playing on the map, the Master Chief is probably blowing up a Covenant capital ship with their own bomb. The description of this map does specify that the Onan is on the other side of the planet as the battle happens though, away from the main conflict. This one is also yet another remake of a Combat Evolved map, the small simplistic map called Longest, although this one is much better executed. The conveyor belts add a dynamic feeling to the map while the color schemes feel much better in aiding the flow of navigation. Another great addition to the Halo 2 multiplayer and one of just a few human based maps. This map, however, is something really special. I'm not sure there's another map in this game that takes place on the Covenant homeworld of High Charity, much less in the series as a whole. Yet here we are. And not only does this take place on High Charity, but you can even see the Gemini Tower from the campaign mission. And not only that, but this is one of only two Halo multiplayer maps to feature blue teleporters instead of green, making it all the more special. The map might be called Gemini, but this area in lore is called Garden of Reverent Contemplation, and that statue is the Prophet of Truth, making this something of a shrine to him. It's also the only multiplayer map to feature active, usable Covenant doors. Yeah, this map is just loaded with special things that can only be found here, and it's super underappreciated in my opinion. The last special element about this map is easily the fact that it's based on an old marathon multiplayer map. It's just a great level, and I love it. Relic is a map that could have a whole 20 minute video about the sheer genius of its minimalistic design, but I'll just cover the basics. Of course the map is on a small island, but the very obvious eye-catching aspect of this map is the massive Forerunner Tower jutting from the island center. Upon reaching Delta Halo, the Covenant believed this tower to be a monument to the fallen Forerunner warriors from their war with the Flood. Following the arrival of the UNSC and Amber Clad to the ring, however, humanity would determine this not to be the case. A surveillance team called Recon 127 mounted up in an Albatross shuttle and went to survey the site, but were unfortunately shot down after encountering Covenant resistance. This ship can be seen having crashed onto the sand of the island. The data picked up from this flyover was transmitted to the In Amber Clad, however, and reveals that this tower is actually just the top of a deeply buried Forerunner ship. 
It's a really cool map and was designed with the intention of making it feel like something out of Combat Evolved, but with a uniquely Halo 2 design and setting. It was also used on the cover of the physical release for the multiplayer map pack. Now this is probably my second favorite map from Halo 2's available selection. Not only is this yet another Earth-centered map, but it features a tramway running straight through the center to create a dynamic and living feeling to the whole thing that also acts as a hazard to players. My favorite maps tend to be ones with moving parts or interactable features, and so I cannot help but loving playing on this one. One of the more interesting bits of trivia about Terminal is that the team bothered to record original lines for the PA announcements. And not just like one or two, there's nearly 30 different possible lines split between both a male and a female announcer that can be heard over the PA. Some of it's pretty fun too, like the male narrator saying, quote, a child's My Pet Blind Wolf stuffed toy has been found, will the owner please claim it at the lost and found, end quote. The Blind Wolf was a cut writable creature from Combat Evolved, so this reference is so niche that it likely went over most people's heads even if they did hear it. The map's asymmetrical nature makes it great for pretty much any game mode, but it is on the bigger side, so 8v8 is where optimal chaos can be freed to ensue. There was only one more final map pack released for the game all the way in 2007, only a couple of months before Halo 3 eventually launched. This was called the Blastacular Map Pack and included two maps to excite players for the conclusion of the trilogy which was coming only a few months later. In my coverage of Combat Evolved's multiplayer maps, we talked about the Forerunner space station called Derelict, and it seems that same design has appeared again, found this time in an abandoned structure on Delta Halo. Another site discovered by the UNSC Coral Sea, this facility is theorized to have once been used for the purpose of studying the wildlife on the ring, until of course the eventual activation of the ring wiped everything out. It's an interesting little map being made as a callback to the old CE level, although with improvements. The most fascinating thing about the map though is that it is one of only two maps across the whole series to spawn a sentinel beam by default, the other being backwash as we covered earlier. It's fun for close quarters, and I really enjoy it overall. This next map, yet another remake of a Combat Evolved map, but one that I really did not like in the first game. Tombstone sought to take the concept of CE's Hang 'em High and improve it. Whether or not that worked, I unfortunately cannot say, as I've never had the chance to play it in a real match. Yet, yeah, even with the MCC out now, it's still pretty hard to find matches on certain maps, which really sucks. I will say that aesthetically and conceptually, this is probably one of the coolest maps in the game. It's set in an old decommissioned munitions depot on the outskirts of New Mombasa, following the slipspace rupture that destroyed the city in the story. We can even see the desolate skyline in the distance. It's awesome. Just playing the map alone feels much better, tighter, and overall like it would be a great map to play on, which makes me really lament that I can't really try it in matchmaking. Also, there is a classic M6D Magnum from Combat Evolved in this map, but we can't get to it to pick it up. These DLC maps would eventually be bundled into a physical disc released for retail called the Halo 2 Multiplayer Map Pack. And that's all of the multiplayer maps available on Halo 2. For the Xbox, as it turns out, the Windows Vista copy of Halo 2 launched with two additional PC exclusive maps for players to sink their teeth into, District and Uplift. Located in Sector 05 of Old Mombasa, District is actually a pretty cool map, way better than most of the Gearbox made CE maps for the PC. This has a really interesting flow to it, and the way it kind of utilizes a parking garage as such a major part of the map gives it a pretty huge degree of added verticality. Not to mention several alleyways and other close quarter areas that could trigger some intense corridor combat. They did a great job of making this map feel lived in too. It's not just an assortment of random buildings, it's got a movie theater, various small shops, and even a big billboard advertisement for Zanzibar as a vacation resort. Tying this map into another map is actually really cool. I love little connections like this. Another great map. I love this one too, but the very limited color palette can give matches a kind of washed out look. 
And finally, we are at our final multiplayer map, and the second PC exclusive map released with Halo 2 Vista, Uplift. We have one last mention of the UNSC Coral Sea, which was the vessel who located this power conduit on Delta Halo. This massive energy node is actually critical in controlling the direction of the ring's movement as it orbits the gas giant called Substance. So it's a really awesome and pretty interesting location to be able to see and play on. The map was designed to feature a forerunner equivalent to the massive space elevator seen in the campaign. And so this sky laser which helped control Delta Halo's movement was created. It's a really great map, even aside from that too. I mean, it plays well, and this bridge makes a great location for some intense battles. Being on the larger side, it's made with 8v8 matches in mind, and is optimal for objective-based games. And that's it. Wow, examining every one of those maps was a little more of a task than I was initially expecting, but I did have fun doing it. It's worth noting that every single one of those maps is now available to anyone with a copy of the Master Chief Collection. So, if you're anxious to go look around, you can literally just go grab it on Steam and boot it up right now. If you're lucky, you may even be able to find a match on one of these rarer maps. I think it goes without saying that when it comes to multiplayer maps, Halo 2 goes far beyond what any of its competitors were doing then, and to be honest, it still outshines pretty much any modern game that's come after it. Each map was made with love, passion, and you can feel how much the team loved contributing not only to the game's community, but to its universe as a whole. Getting to play and talk about these maps has been a genuine pleasure for me, and they're some of the best maps I've seen in any video game's multiplayer to date. Unlike Halo Combat Evolved's Anniversary Remaster, Halo 2's facelift is pretty universally beloved. Not everyone likes it, but it feels like to me the common consensus is that the remaster for Halo 2 is just about the best thing 343 Industries has ever released. Coming out in November of 2014, 10 years after the original Halo 2, this remaster brings with it some of the most gorgeous environments of the entire franchise. It may just be me, but I feel like if you held Halo 2A next to Halo 5 or even Halo Infinite, Halo 2 is going to look better than both of them every time. The blend of Bungie's downright inspired level design and the updated graphics of the 9th generation hardware resulted in some of the most breathtaking sci-fi visuals available in a game. Of course, 343 added terminals for players to find, complete with unskippable little cutscenes to watch. They feel way less mysterious and interesting than the bungee terminals in my opinion, but I still love that they bothered to give us this kind of extra content. They gave the multiplayer a sort of remaster treatment too, selecting six maps to recreate and creating a Halo 2 multiplayer experience on a totally separate engine. It's a cool idea, and it is really fun even having a Forge mode all its own. However, due to the limited maps all being recreations of Halo 2, most people just opt to play the original over this other engine recreation. I think it's really neat and very fun with some incredibly satisfying gameplay, but it honestly never really found its standing and never stood a chance at holding a candle to the original Halo 2's multiplayer. I know I'm just gushing over the game, but it's just such an important part of pop culture. I mean, try to find someone who's never heard of Halo. You'll struggle, and this one is among the best. As a matter of fact, the game's reception reinforces this idea. To say it was acclaimed would be an understatement. Halo 2 released to very high scores. I'm talking 9s and 10s across the board. Check the Metacritic score today, and we can find a 95. The audience score is a bit lower at an 8.9, and I'll admit that did surprise me, but still, those are some very high scores. Halo 2 deserves it as well, this is a fantastic game. Back to the anniversary though, it still plays pretty much exactly the same. It's really only the graphics and music that have been improved. Although I would say the graphics are an absolute improvement, the music isn't necessarily better, just higher fidelity if that makes sense. Due to licensing, Incubus and Breaking Benjamin have been removed outright and replaced with two original pieces written by Misha Mansoor. 
the guitarist from the popular metal band Periphery, a band I listen to actually, but it does not hit the same for me. Every time I play this game, no matter what, it's always back to the original graphics when that Breaking Benjamin track kicks in. It's not Halo 2 if we're not fighting hunters to blow me away by Breaking Benjamin in the Mausoleum of the Arbiter. Anyone who says different is not playing Halo 2 correctly. This is the only correct way to play Halo 2. The soundtrack was re-recorded in full for the Anniversary Edition and only plays when you're in the updated graphics. Every track sounds more crisp, but I wouldn't say it's better. Still, it makes for a really great and polished sounding experience when playing through the Anniversary Edition, which I can happily recommend. Not to mention the cutscenes, which are arguably the single best thing to happen to the franchise since Bungie left. 343 reached out to Blur Studio to handle the new cinematics, and I mean, they speak for themselves. Nothing I could say would say more for these cutscenes than just watching them would. It's all great. That's what I'm trying to say. Halo 2 is a powerhouse game, and regardless of if you want to play through it with classic graphics or remastered graphics, the experience itself is simply an ageless game worth trying. Being a kid, I know a lot of our imaginations were always racing, craving something more. There's a part of all of us that loves the adventures found in fiction, the drama, the courage, the meaning. I can remember how I would play through these games over and over, all three of them just repeatedly. When I would be feeling frustrated or just craving something more, I could step into another world and when I came back to reality, I'd always feel invigorated, ready to get back to life with a newfound optimism. I know this probably sounds overdramatic, and if you can't tell, I'm using the music to really hammer that point home. Maybe you can't relate at all, that's fine, it's just a video game after all, it's not that deep to everyone. I'd have been fine without it, I'm sure we all would have been. But I did have it, and a point I feel like I'm always harping on is how these stories do matter. If you can't understand that, then you really don't understand history. Medieval tales of King Arthur are fun for us now, but they mattered back then. Greek myths, too. Tales of heroism, fighting impossible odds, overcoming adversity. These kinds of stories have always mattered, and they always will. Call him Perseus, call him Hercules, Achilles, call him Sir Galahad or Siegfried, call him John, Thel Vadum, Spartan 117, The Arbiter, or The Master Chief. They're all the same, they're just examples. They're heroes, they're a framework. If you played Halo and walked away with nothing more than the mild satisfaction that you killed some time and you think I'm the weird one for striving to pull something more from it, then honestly, I applaud you. Carry on, man, you're out here enjoying life, but I tend to be a little bit more extra in how I handle my consumption of art. Which is why I started a channel to take advantage of that innate flair for drama. I want to walk away from my experiences feeling like I've been shown something, reminded of something, amped up for the gym or ready to work harder on my goals. It's the games that can't give me that feeling that I feel have failed us. Halo 2 achieves that. Halo 2 is a space opera. It feels very mythic and grand in how it's told while also managing to feel grounded and real. The Arbiter is a tortured warrior shamed for his mistakes and made to fight impossible battles in the Council's name. The Chief is a venerated hero, sure, but with a very tortured past as well. He has no one and nearly nothing left. His life is pledged in service to humanity. He is a sacrificial lamb of sorts. His whole life, childhood, everything. Stolen from him just to make him into a killing machine and like so many of his own brothers and sisters in arms, likely to die for humanity. Alright, enough of that. Time to talk about the music. As you have clearly been hearing, Halo 2 has one of the most gorgeous soundtracks in video game history. A mix of gorgeous strings, pounding drums, blasting horns, keys, guitar, choir, I mean, what more could you even want? 
the work of acclaimed composers Martin O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore, the music of Halo has been undeniably one of the most important factors in the game's success. Sure, everything about the game is great, but I mean, let's be honest here. The music is a solid portion of what made the game so iconic and memorable. I don't know how to really say this, but I just hated covering this game. It was the biggest challenge of any video I've done so far, and due sheerly to my closeness to and adoration of this game, no matter what I wrote or how I wrote it, I continuously felt like I wasn't doing the game justice. It was like trying to tackle something that I was potentially too close to. I still covered it because of how much I love it, but I feel more now than before that this game might be, in some ways, too big for me to cover. The script kept getting longer and longer, I kept missing deadlines for when I wanted the video out, pushing it back further and further. Even now, as you are watching this video, I still feel a deep sense that I've left so much out that I feel I could have talked more about. But in a weird way, I feel like it's oddly appropriate that finishing this video left me feeling there was more to do. A feeling of empty incompleteness, because after all, that is how the game itself leaves us, isn't it? Nearly two decades later, and this game has still aged finer than any wine. I've known people who went back and played it for the first time, and even they had to come back and tell me how good it was. Ultimately, I have not seen another game that delivers on its name as well as this game does. Halo 2 features a second Halo ring, dual wielding two of multiple guns, two protagonists. I mean, it ups the ante as far as an ante can be upped. Halo 2 is a game that continues to stand, in my opinion, as the best game Bungie has ever made. Thanks so much for watching everyone. This video has been in the works for nearly a year. I actually started on the script shortly after my first Halo retrospective dropped, but I got distracted because I was having so much fun doing Star Wars. But I kept on chipping away at this script until now, when I can finally deliver to you my extensive Halo 2 retrospective. If you enjoyed it or had fun, then be sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Special thanks to my friend Deadlifts for the Dark Gods for joining me on this video. He and I have been friends for a really long time, and we've been talking about doing something with Halo for like three years, I think? So it's pretty cool to finally see it materialize. I hope you've enjoyed your time with me here today, and thanks again for watching. Of course, I hope to see you in the next video, but until then, that's all I've got for you. This video might be over, but honestly, I think we're just getting started. Listen, Tinkerbell, don't make me 